You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. The Options Insider Radio Network is sponsored by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Advisor's, advisors option. option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, advisor's option. option. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for the advisor's option, the program for you out there, the busy financial advisor or asset manager. Maybe you're already dabbling in those options waters. Maybe you're thinking about doing it, but you're a little bit hesitant. Maybe you're getting some client demand, uh, which is a good thing. 
<laughs> driving you in that direction. Whatever brings you to us, welcome. And don't worry, we've got you covered in that regard. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. And, of course, many ways for you guys to enjoy this fine program. Most of you like to enjoy it. Subscribing to the direct feed or to the network feed via your platform of choice. We welcome that. Pocket Cast, iTunes, Google Podcasts, whatever you like. Of course, you can always grab our mobile app so you can get all the back episodes of this program and every other program we've done on the network for pretty much 11 years now, 11 years and change, which is scary to say, but it's true. Uh, or, of course, you can always join us live. Uh, in this case, via the Mixler link. You'll see it over there whenever we tweet it out. That's when the show goes live. This one's kind of kind of moves around the calendar a little bit, so it's hard to give you an exact day and time every week. But if you're there listening, you want to join us live, welcome. We enjoy. However you listen, make sure you hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, all your pearls of wisdom. You guys always send us in some interesting directions, and we appreciate it. So keep those questions coming. And joining me on the Old Advisors Option program today, let's go in a sweeping arc all the way around the U.S. and even out into some of the territories and then back again here to Chicago. So let's start all the way out in the far hinterlands. Usually we go all the way out to Maine. We're not going to go quite that far. We're going to go one state over or so to the land of New Hampshire, where we are joined by Mr. Matt Ambertson, the principal, indeed the founder over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services. His business card is very big. Matt, welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks, Mark. It's a big day. It's National Cheeseburger Day. And so uh, right after this, so we have some great burger places here in Portsmouth. So uh, excited for that. It's been uh, it's been an interesting weekend. Uh, Florence has given us some surfing waves, much like where I grew up in California. So it feels like a little bit like home out here in New Hampshire, Mark. I do remember those days in southern New England where, yeah, you go out the day before or after the storm and you get nice little uh, just nice little turbulence to enjoy in the waters a little bit. That's about the only part of the hurricane that's enjoyable. <laughs> but yes. uh, but to those parts, for the part people who aren't directly affected, yeah, there are some interesting effects. Of course, a lot of rain, too, which can be welcome or unwelcome, depending on the part of the country. Uh, but either way, uh, interesting stuff afoot. Nice to be central central part of the country these days where we don't have to uh, we don't have to worry too much about those types of things anymore. Now we're going to go back around, going to swing the arm of the clock all the way down to coast and out into the ocean where they know a thing or two about hurricanes out there, all the way out to scenic and sunny Puerto Rico, uh, where they're probably very thankful they dodged this one, and where we are joined by Chris Hausman. He is the Director of Risk Management and the Chief Technical Strategist. His business card is also very big, over there at Swan Global Investments. Chris, welcome back to the program. How goes it out there in scenic and sunny Puerto Rico, sir? Good, Mark. Gentlemen, good to be back. Uh, Yeah, I certainly don't wish a hurricane on anyone, um, but you learn quickly when you go through one, I'll tell you. Hey, you learn to stock up and prepare or maybe get the heck out of Dodge. Probably some of the best advice uh, that is when it's coming your way. Maybe just get the heck out of Dodge and uh, always, uh, always a good strategy (laughs) when that stuff's bearing down on you. Now we're going to circle that dial of the clock all the way back, almost back to Chicago again, but a little bit outside of it to a little provincial hamlet we know as St. Charles. where We are joined by our good friend, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management, one of the few advisors out there actually slinging some options. Mr. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. You are uniquely qualified to be on this program, sir. Uh, I think I just, I, I, I was on mute. My apologies. Good to be here as always. You pulled an Andrew at the beginning of the show already, and you're already pulling an Andrew. Well, it's your fault, sir, that we go, we're going down this interesting particular rabbit hole today, so I thought it was appropriate that you join us to do just that. So without further ado, let's dive into it, our Options 101 segment. It's time to learn how to manage risk and generate additional income for your clients. It's time for Options 101. All right, everybody, welcome to Options 101. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where we break down some of those interesting introductory options concepts that you can use in your own portfolios and indeed in your clients' portfolios. This one's a little bit of a combo position, so not quite an Options 201, but maybe a little bit more, one step beyond the basic Options 101. And we were talking about this strategy earlier in this week, actually, Uncle Mike and I were talking about it on a different show, and it got me thinking, you know, because this is a great strategy for advisors, and I thought, you know, we haven't really touched on it 
in the advisor's office, at least not in quite some time. So I went back and did some digging. And the last time we touched on this, <laughs> this program was all the way back in July of 2013. So it has been quite some time. I think it's time to revisit this particular strategy, which uh, has known by many names. I like to call it the wheel. Uncle Mike and his ilk will like to call it the wheel of fun. So there's some might call it the triple income strategy, even many different names. But it's time to revisit this old favorite uh, the wheel. What is it, quite frankly, if you're not familiar with this one? It combines two strategies we've talked about before on this show many times. It kind of just puts them together in one in one, one nice, tasty, delicious package, if you will. It starts with our old friend, the cash-secured put. So, of course, selling typically an out-of-the-money put and cash-secured, because a lot of times you're doing this in accounts where you can't use leverage. Uh, so cash-secured, so you have the cash set aside to buy the stock at that particular strike price. If you are indeed so inclined, if you're not familiar with what cash secured puts are, indeed, I, I refer you to the many episodes on this show or indeed on this network where we go into those in a lot more detail, listeners. But the uh, the rub of it is you identify a price you'd like to buy the stock in. And instead of working a limit buy order in the stock, which everyone is familiar with out there, you instead sell a put at or around that strike price and hopefully collect some income perhaps even a decent amount of income, to do exactly what you were going to do in the stock market anyway. That's the benefit. And then the flip side of it is if you get the stock put to you, if you get assigned on those puts, uh, then uh, all of a sudden you now own the stock. Now what do you do? You have stock. Well, here comes the second part, hence the wheel. The wheel kind of spins. It spins to get you into the stock, and then it spins again to get you out of it. And that's the covered call side of the wheel as well. Now, you own the stock. You do what you would do anyway. You identify a level where you think is a reasonable place to sell that stock, and you sell an out-of-the-money covered call. Or maybe more aggressive, if you want to go in the money, it's up to you. Wherever you, wherever you want to sell that call, collect that income. And then you go forth. If the stock rallies, the stock gets taken away. You rinse and repeat, do the wheel again. And on. that's why it's called the wheel. It goes round and round and round. And hopefully it works out for you pretty well along the way. Uh, Mike, like I said, since we were just talking about it and you were kind of responsible for putting the, putting the germ in my brain as we were thinking about it here for the show today, I'll give you pride of place here as our guest as well. Give us our thoughts. You're an, an advisor actually out there doing this for clients. So maybe let's start there. What is it that attracted you to the wheel? Why do you like doing this on behalf of the clients? And maybe what are some of your thoughts on kind of the pros and cons, the benefits and drawbacks of doing the wheel? Yeah, I think oftentimes what people do incorrectly when they talk about a covered call or selling a put in general is that they try and view it as kind of an either or strategy. Why would you do a covered call when you could just buy the stock and have an unlimited upside? Or why would you buy the stock when you can get income on doing the covered call? Uh, I think it's uh, it's an area to where uh, it's uh, you need several different things in order to do it the right way within a portfolio. So um, I believe that you need to have some section of your portfolio that's dedicated towards growth, some section of your portfolio that's dedicated towards income, among a lot of other things. Uh, what I like about the wheel style of strategy, uh, you have a lot of flexibility with it. So let's say that you want to uh, collect a little bit of an income. You want to get X per a certain percent of money coming in every month. Um, I don't think that the wheel is the only strategy that you should use for your monthly income strategy for the people who are retired, but it can definitely contribute to it. And so... The benefit of selling an option, the premium that you collect is yours forever. That premium belongs to you. That is, uh, it's your money. Uh, what you give up, though, for taking payment is that you take on the obligation of selling the, st the stock at the specific strike price uh, or buying the stock at the specific strike price should you be selling a put. But if you're looking to get some type of an income, I think it can be very flexible. Now, with that being said, what if you're not looking to get an income? Does a covered call or does the wheel strategy still have a place in your portfolio? And I think it can, because uh, there are going to be years where the market is more flat uh, or down for that matter. And if you look at just the historical results of the uh, XY, BXM, you can kind of get an idea of what the CBOE has done to the historical data on that. But what to do by having exposure to selling premium is it's another asset class. And in years when the market does go lower or stays relatively flat, it can still outperform. Now, obviously, if we have a 
30% up year in the S&P 500, selling covered calls probably isn't going to outperform, but that doesn't happen every year. But over time, it can be very beneficial to have it for not only an income stream, if that's something with which you're looking to do, but also uh, if you want to have another kind of modified asset class. You could argue that this is, uh, you, you could have uh, volatility as an asset class by, in some way, shape, or form, by doing the wheel trade, or you could also have uh, time decay as an asset class by doing the wheel trade. This is something that's becoming more and more popular as the years go by, and uh, more advisors are starting to do this. Yeah, you know, it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is a popular trade, one of the reasons why we wanted to bring it back on this show, and it's a shame we haven't had a chance to talk about it, because one, one of the themes, one of the narratives we like to build in this show, a lot of advisors and asset managers come to the options class with perhaps some misperceptions in their head about what goes on here. They think of options as overtly complex and overly risky, and they're risk-additive instruments, and they bring a lot of needless complexity. And what the truth is, as we all know, is quite the opposite, and it can be approached in some very simple ways, and that's what we like to convey here on this show. It isn't all about ratio reverse iron condor swaps and crazy things like that. It, you can do things very in a very simple and effective manner to benefit your clients. Uh, Matt, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if this is a strategy you've been asked about, but you get asked about a lot of strategies over there in the land of option rats. You guys are the king's of the options back test after all. So you actually have the data. One of the reasons why I love having you on the show, we can all, we can all just, you know, use our anecdotal data to kind of fill in this. You have the actual empirical data, uh, which we like. First off, let's start at kind of maybe 10,000 foot level. What are your thoughts maybe on this particular strategy and its efficacy for our audience, for the advisors out there? Then I'm sure, as you always do, you've come armed with some data you probably ran some back tests for yourself. So if you want to share those results with our audience, I wouldn't hold it against you, sir. Yeah, I like the wheel strategy. Um, we have actually named a part of our back test uh, the wheel because uh, we we like the way uh, it kind of automates or, or not, it tells you some rules on, on how to get into particular stocks. So I use it for for my personal trading. For example, when I when I buy something out there in the world, I, I often look and see if I want to buy the stock. And then, um, so I did this recently. Uh, I won't say the stock, but um, you know, so I buy you know a certain number of shares, and then maybe I'll sell a put underneath. So I, I like to not only uh, just sell the put. I want to participate right away. Uh, because the problem with selling the put only is if it goes up tremendously, you've uh, you've made a good call, but you don't participate fully. So I'll, I will. So if I let's just say I want you know, a total of 200 shares, what I'll do is I will, you know, buy maybe buy 100 and sell one put below, and then do the wheel with that one put. So if it goes down, we get another one. There's my 200. And if it goes up, I'm still happy. And uh, so that's how I like to do it. As far as so you, you as like doubling as, down, you like going a little bit of option, a little bit of stock because you don't want to miss that upside. That's the one, one of the few downsides of this is your idea. If you're right, you're you might miss on some upside, so you, you don't want to be right. that guy. Exactly, and so um, you know that's how I always do it. Especially when your wife tells you to buy a certain stock and, and you sell a put and it goes way up, and you have to explain to her, well, no, I just uh, you know I sold a put and we but, made. But I $1. had bullish exposure. It just wasn't where yeah. I needed it to be. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work real well. So I, I buy a hundred shares and then uh, sell a put. Um, so as far as the back testing goes, um, you know that's what we see as well. Is is um, you know selling puts. You know obviously over this live our our back testing goes back to 2007. Um, it, you know, selling puts is uh, generally a strategy that looks good over that period, and selling calls actually is a is a uh, strategy that that doesn't look that good o over the period. Uh, you know, you have especially in, with some of these high flying stocks, you have to sell really out of the money calls in order for them to, you know, look decent uh, with, you know, with the big run ups that you're saying. So uh, the way I, so what, what it, the back testing kind of tells me is, is you could kind of get aggressive on that put selling, you know, you want to get in anyway. And then on the call, on the call selling, once you do get the stock, sell it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm out in the 10 Delta range. So just getting a little bit of ex additional income and then I don't lose um, that that kind of large move that you'll see in some of these stocks. Some of the, sometimes that's the only, you know, you'll see one big move and it'll just be flat for the rest of you know the year, for example. And you know, so you don't want to miss out on that on that on that 
uh, that quick run up. So that's that's what I've seen in our testing, and that's the way I like to use the wheel, Mark. So don't cut off your upside when you do get the stock. Some people maybe yes. scramble and they write an aggressive at the money call because they want to just wheel it. And you're saying don't do that uh, because that you're going to miss that the pop, which could be the lion's share of the profit in this position. That's what our testing shows. Yeah. Did you try it with your flavor too, with a little bit of stock too? Well, the, uh, you know, the stock has been generally, it, it, and it obviously depends on, on what you're doing. But for, you know, the S&P 500 ones, it, it likes being, it likes having the stock, let's put that, which is not um, not surprising here, given the, yeah. what the market's been doing. But um, that, you know, at least personally for me, I like to, you know, back in the, in the market making days, you know, you, if you have a certain amount of, of deltas to buy, you want to buy, you want to make sure you get a, a you know, a little bit of them on the first move, and then and then wait and see what the what the stock's going to do. I, I take the same approach to the wheel. If I like a stock, I want to get into it and then sell a put as well. Uh, so you know, that's the way I'm I'm working it. Mark. He goes big or he goes home, ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to uh, to buying a stock. He listens to his wife, which is a smart man. Smart man out there on coming to financial decisions. Uh, Chris, same thoughts for you. You know, what are your thoughts on the on the strategy in general? And then B, perhaps. Uh, its efficacy, or perhaps lack thereof, maybe you're not a fan there, for its use case for advisors and asset managers out there? No, I think it's a pretty versatile strategy because it appeals to both technicians and fundamentalists. Um, if you're a technician and there's a good uh, support level, you know, that's definitely, you can take that, uh, you know, take advantage of that by selling, you know, the out and out puts. The other thing we haven't mentioned is that the puts take advantage of that natural skew level. So I think entering on the put side, you know, especially in the market environment or if we're in an overall bullish environment, you get some type of pullback and a pop in volatility and you're at some or near a support area that you wouldn't mind owning the stock, then it's a great tool. Um, and, you know, conversely for the fundamentalists, I mean, maybe they're looking at an area that where there's a lot of value for a certain stock and they would like to own it. Um, you know, once, once you do get assigned and you're along the stock, I kind of, I agree with, uh, Matt, as far as the deltas are concerned, if you sell anything higher than a 25 delta call, it's going to be a pretty tough proposition, especially in a bullish market like we're at. So you, you do want to leave a little bit of room for the underlying to move, uh, especially in the upside in this type of environment. Cause you know, I, I agree with Matt on the testing, anything over a 25 delta is going to be a pretty hard sell as far as the call side is concerned. There you go. All fans here of the wheel trade let's just recap really quickly uh before we and we'll give some final thoughts before we roll on out of the second kind of want to just give you a refresher uh, we do have an episode we'll link to it in the show notes where we go into this in, in a lot more detail but you know let's let's look at your basic xyz everyone's favorite stock we've all made fortunes in that trading around 100 maybe you think you want to buy it for around 95 bucks but uh, you're maybe maybe you don't want to buy you just don't want, want to work the limit ordering out get paid for it so let's say in our example you sell the 95 strike put instead in our example you get a nice round dollar for it oh how juicy how nice that would be uh, <laughs> so your effective strike price to buy the stock now effective buying price is actually now 94 dollars uh you have two scenarios there of course the stock rallies like kind of matt was alluding to you don't get the upside participation but you do keep that book uh so you could do that again rinse and repeat or you can maybe do it the matt flavor maybe you have a little bit of stock too so you get the run-up and then you also have the put on the downside so in case it goes against you you get some more stock at a better price uh and then of course uh or you have the stock you know you know let's say you get the stock it goes below the 95 strike you get the stock now you have it. What do you do? We just kind of talked about that as well. Uh, you don't want to be too aggressive, it sounds like, from the data. And, of course, from you know, anecdotal evidence looking at, the, particularly if you're doing this in the S&P, which I'm sure a lot of you on the advisor side will be doing this, maybe in SPY, maybe some of you larger ones out there in SPX or other big index products. We all know it's been a pretty much pronounced bull market. So the more aggressive you are in clipping that bull, the more it's going to impact your profits. So be a little bit, shall we say, <laughs> let's be a little bit less aggressive on the upside. I think Matt was saying around a 10 delta uh, is a good place uh, to be. It's obviously a very pretty far out of the money call there. Uh, and that will, of course, give you the chance to participate on the upside. Then it gets called away and you get paid for that stock. Again, let's say in this example, again, 105, sell that for a buck. Your effective sale price, 106. Stock goes up to 105. You sell it, rinse and repeat. You can do that over and over again, hence the name of the wheel. Again, benefits are the, of this is, is effectively it is adding an income stream to trades you theoretically are already doing. You're already working buy and sell orders in large indices or whatever else you're trading on behalf of your clients already. This is a way to add an income stream to things you're doing already. Get paid for risk. If you're working limit orders, you've all seen flash crash in other areas. Limit orders are risk. 
you should be compensated for that. This is the way uh, to do uh, just, just that. Downside, we kind of mentioned before, obviously, if you just do the puts as an entry point, you may miss an upside run-up. Also, all the downside of just selling puts is there as well. But then again, if you're identifying strike prices where you want, you actually would buy and sell the stock in the real world anyway, then the downside is really kind of minimal because uh, you're doing things you probably would be doing already anyway, but it's getting paid to do it. Uh, so interesting ideas. Mike, since you kind of were the genesis for this, I'll give you uh, the pride of final thoughts on this. Uh, any final thoughts on the wheel trade? And also, maybe do you have any thoughts on Matt's flavor of it, if you will, where you'd ever do it this way, where you have, because that's the one complaint I hear from people, well, I don't want to miss the stock. Uh, do you ever do it? We have a little bit of stock and then a little bit of a smattering of puts to get a little bit of both. Yeah, I definitely have done it that way at times. I think you need to have a variety of strategies when doing this. I think another way with which you can do this is uh, going back to our good old friend XYZ stock. You can buy the stock for 100, sell a 105 call, and then if you're concerned with the stock going up to 140, then you can also buy a 110 call, and you're essentially selling a call spread against the stock itself. So I think that's another way with which to look at it. I've done that in the past. And uh, the other final thing that I'd like to add to this is that sometimes when people look into this, they get a little bit over levered in that uh, if you're doing this on margin, the maintenance requirement for selling a put can be very generous and also very tempting. Uh, however, if the stock goes against you, that can really bite you in the butt pretty quickly. So I would definitely recommend having a very good understanding of what level of leverage is most comfortable to you when selling a put, uh, as well as uh, doing a covered call. Uh, so those would be my final thoughts on the strategy. And uh, it's very interesting. And I think it has a place in a lot of people's portfolios. What else has a lot of has a place in a lot of people's portfolios is our next segment. It is time to get into the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market. So we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody, welcome to The Buzz, the portion of the show where we tell you some of the interesting breaking news trends developments in the world of options and derivatives and how they pertain to you, uh, the busy advisor. This next one actually comes on behalf of a listener, and it's kind of an interesting one. It's a little bit more timely, not specific to options, or we can certainly make it that way, but it is due to that time of year. We are recording this in kind of early to mid-September, and uh, this is Time Flies. As our listener, J3 Dingle, reminded us, it said it's the 10th anniversary of Lehman my How Time Flies. Can you get the guests and you to reminisce on this week's shows? Thank you. He's a good listener. Uh, he asked for every show to weigh in. It's kind of a big question, but we thought, you know, it's actually a good topic and very, very apropos to this particular show as well, which is why I kind of wanted to bring it up here because it has been 10 years since Lehman and oh, what a, what a decade it has been. A lot has happened in the world of options and derivatives. I gave my thoughts on another show earlier this week. I'll very quickly recap them. My main takeaways from that whole heady period, uh, it was about a year and change into launching uh, the, uh, the Options Insider. So we were kind of underway now and running. And then this uh, Lehman hits. And of course, the, the short sale bomb comes right after that. And that was just like someone had set off a, a nuclear device in the world of options. It just set everything on its head. Uh, this, this thing that had been integral to the market making function forever, which is being short stock, was now taken away. And so all the many different implications that had some guys in the broad indices like where I used to play had a great time. Other guys in single name equities had a hard time options market making. So it was it was a very dramatic time. And that's kind of my main uh, takeaway. But I like to go around the horn. Uh, let's start with let's start up in the hinterlands with Matt. Matt, I'm curious your thoughts uh, if you were doing, I think you were doing ORATS at the time, you may have still been market making back in the Lehman days. Uh, what are your kind of primary thoughts, memories, or as our listener says, reminiscences <laughs> of, uh, of the Lehman debacle 10 years ago and perhaps its aftermath for options? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a scary time, but I, um, I was running ORATS and I did have a, uh, a portfolio to protect and I had some portfolio protection and I remember those puts just absolutely blowing up. I had some way, way out of the money puts and, um, those absolutely blew up and, and saved, you know, some of the, the longs that I had in there. So, uh, I've, I've used that, uh, I've used that experience of the 2008 debacle to, to craft some of the, the strategies that we put out there. Um, and, and really, uh, to, to, uh, 
to beat the drum for people just to have something on way out of the money. Uh, you never know when it's going to uh, come into to use. Uh, I mean, I, I was lucky that I had had them on. You know, being a market maker, a past market maker, you you, you always feel like something uh, could happen that's very unexpected. So, so that's what I remember most uh, most clearly about that time. Um, I, I I gotta I have to admit, I, I worked at Lehman Brothers in, uh, in college, and so I have that uh, going for me. And then I also talked to one of the partners in the uh, Lehman you know that was basically responsible for the 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 collapse and he was telling me he's like you know we're making so much money and I go you're basically just selling way out of the money puts on uh, you know these these CDOs and so uh, <laughs> they were insuring it, you know, the whole it's, marketplace it's a, yeah <laughs> how nice of them it's a cr it's a crazy crazy thing anyway so um, you know that that's what I remember most about the about that time mark does seem like whenever some guys get it in their heads to sell puts is when the whole market ends up paying for it in some uh, in some crazy way, whether it's, you know, bearings or, you know, Lehman or any other version of that uh, they're in. So they decide, hey, selling premiums is a great thing. Let's do a ton of it way more than we can ever possibly handle. And no one apparently notices. And and we're all still dealing with the ramifications. Speaking of which ramifications, Chris. Uh, 10 years ago, where were you during Lehman crisis? And also kind of what are your thoughts on the lasting implications of what we're all doing now, which is the options market? Well, I was managing a hedge fund for a family office at the time. So I definitely remember, I think the biggest thing about the Lehman crisis was who's next. You know, it, it brought an element of unknown, you know, what other large bank or institution could could fail as well. Um, you know, one of the interesting things, you know, that, that kind of period, I was not on the floor anymore. You know, that kind of period is great for market makers who are on the floor. I think that's what you live for is those those violent times. But one of the things I, I remember about the term structure is that the entire term structure shifted. So it was possible, even though, you know, the short premium trade was very, very challenging at the time. You know, it was possible to roll out puts and stay alive and stay in the game. So because of that term structure was very, very elevated. Um, it's a little bit different nowadays. I think what, what happens during the sell offs now is that you just see the front months um, really get bit up, but the longer term stuff kind of stays there. So, you know, that's a different type of environment where, you, you know, you had a better shot at getting out of positions if you were shorting premium back then, as opposed to now it's a little bit more difficult because, you know, longer term volatility needs some type of structural shift. And we just haven't seen any type of structural shift here in the last seven or eight years. But the Lehman event was definitely a structural shift that affected everything across the board. And that's something that I think a lot of people have not seen over the last 10 years. So that's that's what sticks out. I mean, it definitely was challenging time if you were shorting premium, but the volatility structure back then still gave you a chance to kind of get out and reset and put new positions on, you know, at, at better volatility levels. Yeah, these kind of these kind of anniversaries are good reminders that these you're right, these crazy structural events can happen every now and then. They happen in September quite often, September 11th of Lehman. That, that seems to be a bad time for those types of events that reshape everything that goes on around them before and since. Uh, so, yeah, th those are the kind of things where even if you have great risk management, sometimes things can happen, like expiration in the case of 9-11. Uh, so, yeah, the unknown unknowns lurking out there are perhaps why, you know, like Matt was saying earlier, you get it beaten to your head sometimes as an option market maker. And maybe don't be ever net caught net short units. And this is that's a good argument for when those types of events happen to have those those bullets. It worked out for Matt, worked out for others in that time frame. Having those bullets in your back pocket can be helpful. Mike, you and I kind of talked about this earlier this week, but if you have any any quick thoughts, any quick updates on your thoughts on just the impact of Lehman a decade later, sir, have at it. No, I mean, <clears throat> it's it's a different time now. And um, you know, just the one thing that I'll add from what we talked about earlier was that uh, – you know, the, my, one of my favorite sayings in all of trading, uh, yeah, I made lots of money selling all those puts, and then to, 2008 came around, but who could have possibly predicted that? And then the other trader says to the person who says that, the person who is uh, buying those puts from you. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, Matt, Matt, turns out Matt was the guy buying those puts. So uh, well done there, Matt. And uh, yeah, something just, just to think about, and our listeners were asking us about that. I thought it was a good thing, particularly on this show, to kind of just look back at some of the, Sometimes these structural things happen. And they change the way we look at the market, the way the market performs, the way things happen before and since. So it's good to just keep these in mind as you're out there uh, harvesting the premium on behalf of your clients. Uh, speaking of things and we talked before, you know, and it, there is some data out there uh, that shows uh, if you did buy the day before Lehman, it's been a rough road, but you are doing all right now. I think it was Market Watch who ran some analysis on this. And there, actually, it wasn't doesn't it isn't as crazy as it may sound uh, that. Uh, that uh, you know, you, someone would buy 
before uh, the dip in Lehman because the market actually had been selling off for a while. And there are some technicals that uh, made it seem like maybe that was a decent time to buy. If you were one of those people and you bought on the exact eve of Lehman, you're still doing all right if you bought, bought and hold up uh, 130% if you had a pure S&P portfolio. If you had the typical 60-40 stock bond portfolio, uh, you've got 8% <laughs> over the last 10 years. So maybe that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a reason. You're up 130% uh, in the S&P portfolio as well. We'll get to more of that 60-40 bond portfolio in a second. But Matt, I know as the owner of all those puts, you probably have some final thoughts on all things Lehman and its impact, sir. Yeah, um, what I forgot to mention is is 2009 owning those puts, uh, we got pretty murdered. <laughs> so there's uh, definitely a, you get cut both ways, you know, with, with those elevated prices, uh, and then the market going up and the volatility coming in. You know, that took a lot of the vague out. So I don't want to say like it was a. Uh, it was the, the the best thing ever because then I kind of got well I have to have you know more puts on so uh, you know it's a it's a it's a long road and 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 since then uh, obviously you, you haven't done real well you've maybe got a couple blips um, and again I use that same strategy if you get some profit in those way out of the money puts you know take a bit of them roll roll some out and then you know but keep some but you, because they're really going to go down uh, if the market turns around Mark. Well said, sir. Speaking of the market turnaround, seems like we got a little bit of that going on. The numbers are out for August from our friends over there at uh, at OCC. So before we get to that, really quickly, I know uh, Chris, you, you you maybe you sold some of those puts to Matt. Uh, so if you have some questions for him, have at it, sir. Well, I never sold the teeny puts, so I mean those those are a bad proposition. You want to be owners of that. I completely agree for Matt. Um, but my question is, you know, when you are playing in the lottery ticket space, these highly cryptotic type options, I mean, is there a general rule that you have that you start booking your profits? I mean, I know these things are really meant to be 5, 10, 20 baggers. Is there some number where you're like, hey, you know, just 10 times my money, this is the point where I need to take money off? Or, you know, unlike when you sell a, a meteor put, a 50 delta, 40 delta, 30 delta type put, you know, if you get a one bagger, two bagger, that's you know, that's good P&L for those type of options. But, you know, is there a general rule that you have, you know, when you're dealing with the teeny stuff? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And, and we've we've talked before about uh, the very long term studies because with 2008 and, you know, a few blips since then, there hasn't been a whole lot of of opportunities for these uh, small puts um, so that, you know, that long term study is going to be real interesting. But what I'm finding is even February and and, and August uh, of 2015, um, you know, even getting uh, like you know a, a profit of 400 percent or four times, uh, you know, see, you know that works so, sometimes, but um, a lot of times you'll miss. A lot of times you won't get anything. So what I what I uh, do is kind of the same thing I did as a market maker. Um, if you get a big dur- uh, downturn. You know, take twenty percent off the table. To, you know, just uh, get, take a little bit of profit because that'll that'll fund, um, you know, a lot of those months when when you're just bleeding out. Um, so so that's what I like to say when when, um, when 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 you get something in your favor big time, like you know, even a one x or you know, doubling your your, your money or or tripling your money. Uh, you know, take a little bit of profit. Uh, don't be a pig. But yeah, you're right. You know, you buy those. You buy those uh, maybe five delta options, and if they get to 25 delta, maybe you take some off. Uh, so that's that's how we're testing it. You know, 250 uh, percent profit, 300 percent profit, take some off, Chris. Yeah, I think uh, maybe Mark was even at this conference. I was at one of the conferences, and there was a tail risk manager that said, you know, the scariest thing for a tail risk fund is a tail risk event because the yeah. most difficult thing is, you know, w- when the house is on fire and you've got all these awesome units and they're making all this money, a lot of people get a little bit too comfortable with them and they want to hold on hold on to them a little too long and then they miss, you know, this great incredible P&L situation. So I think the the you know, to wrap that up, you have to have some discipline and you have to have a plan going into it because, it, you know, when you buy these lottery tickets, you don't expect to win the lottery. But then all of a sudden it happens and then you're like, what do I do now? So, yeah, I think, you know, Matt's dead on is just to take some money off the table, have pre, you know, um, risk management points where you want to book some profits and move on into other types of strategies. 
Yeah, you're right. I forgot which fund it was that said that. It was at the risk management conference, but I, I definitely made note of that. That was a great comment. <laughs> the most terrifying thing for a tail risk fund, which ostensibly should be in the business of preparing for that, is actually having what they're preparing for happen. Because uh, quite often, perhaps they're not prepared for it. Are you right? They said they uh, maybe they, uh, they're looking a little bit too greedy. That's their moment in the sun. They need to shine. And maybe that uh, that gets back to them. Speaking of shining, the options market was shining last month in August. The numbers coming out from our friends over there at the Options Clearing Corp. Uh, August volume overall up 10%. They're cleared contract volume. Remember, they clear a lot of stuff there at OTC. So let's drill down a little bit. Exchange listed options volume. That's what we're interested in. 426.2 million contracts up 12%. From August of 2017, so a year ago, uh, equity options drilling down a little bit further, 384 million, pretty much even. That's a 17 percent increase from August the year before. So August rocking and rolling this year. Uh, cleared ETF options volume 145.2 million contracts. That's actually a 5 percent decrease from August of 2017. And index options again. Kind of an interesting uh, little dark spot on an otherwise bright uh, announcement. Uh, down 18% with 42.2 million contracts from uh, down from a year before. Uh, but uh, still, but year-to-date overall numbers in the equity, in, in, excuse me, in the index options are up 12%. Also worth noting, futures, uh, which OCC clears, uh, are uh, down a little bit. They primarily clear VIX futures, listeners. So most of that down, that, and they're down 50% from August of a year ago. So that shows still how the marketplace is still digesting the ramifications of February and the VIX ocalypse, call it what you will, where so many of those inverse volatility products who were big buyers and traders of the futures uh, got pretty much wiped out or reshuffled, reimagined, and we're still kind of living in the wake of that. So uh, volume down 50%. And ADV uh, from August and ADV overall for the year down 27%. So that's not a, uh, a great thing. Speaking of Vixland, uh, Chris, you and I have talked before about this on the show uh, and Matt as well about, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the issues with Vix and all the lawsuits swirling around it uh, right now and what an interesting area that is and contentious area that is for a lot of people out there, particularly in the advisor asset manager space. Maybe they want to play in VIX land and they're worried about some of these issues they're seeing out there with the lawsuits. And, you know, so we've said before many times on the show, if you're worried about that, of course, if you just avoid the settlement, if you roll through it or around it or close out positions, you don't have to worry about that kind of quote unquote manipulation that's going on. But that said, if you are concerned about this recently, uh, CBO announced uh, they're going to start alerting people. So things they maybe probably should have been doing a while ago, they're finally coming around to doing, building more transparency. Remember, some of the issues listeners are on that crazy opening quotation uh, and how that impacts the prices. And if there's order imbalances going on, that's what causes these crazy prints and things to happen as a result. So the CBO says beginning this month, they're going to alert clients if they spot any developments that could impact the monthly settlements uh, via email so that any factors that could train these factors that could excuse me factors that could trigger a notice include major market moving news supply demand imbalances that's the big one in s&p 500 options or overnight turbulent trading you get your notice before the market opens the next day so hey they're going to tell you it's nice of them to warn you hey something weird may be afoot i don't know chris uh, we talked about this before on the show uh first off you've any thoughts about the numbers overall feel three and then secondly does this alerting system does this uh, maybe ease any of your concerns or just make you i know you guys don't really sling a lot of vix but you play in the s p uh does this uh what are your thoughts on this kind of bringing a little bit more transparency to that process as well well, I mean, more transparency is always a good thing. I think the problem with the VIX is a lot of people don't read, you know, go to SIBO's website, get the white paper, and really understand what this thing is. Um, I, I wish that the SIBO would kind of pimp the old VIX, VXO, right? Uh, because that was more of a volatility type measurement. It was only a couple of strikes up and down at the money. So you got a better feel for what true volatility is. You know, when we start looking at the new VIX, even though there was a, a cry for it, and I completely understand it because, you know, people are like, well, it doesn't take into SKU. You know, obviously it's taking into way too much baby type options and kurtosis, that little area, right? So, you know, maybe it was flawed to begin with. I think there were people several years saying, hey, this could be manipulated. And it was just a matter of time before uh, the word got out. And so, um, you know, as transparency, I think that's just, uh, it's going to be one way to stop people from manipulating it but you know again nobody wants to trade a product where manipulation is is quote unquote uh, potential so i think that you know sebo's trying to stay in front of it and uh, the more color they give out the better for everybody yeah you know i agree and i was one of those people who kind of cheered the new version i think i think the skew of done rightly done correctly adds value there's information there you know 
it, it's not just at the money ball. I know, you know, Scott nations and others who have the at the money ball products may disagree and others will certainly, and they have that VXO to look at, not a tradable product really, but a, you know, a VXO to look at, but I, there, it can be done. Well, I don't know, Matt, are you of that thought as well? You know, as the man who looks at all the data, uh, do you think that, uh, that skew provides value or do you think it's, it's, you know, it's kind of more problems that cause more headaches than it's worth right now. And also if you have thoughts on kind of just the continued growth of the option space outside of index and equity, options in august uh, have added as well sir yeah the latter so i i agree with with chris in a lot of ways that uh using those small options it, it kind of overshadows the the vixen a bit you know o rats does our own calculation in, of of the at the money volatilities and we use we use about the 85 to, to 15 delta calls and inputs and um, we draw a we draw a tangent at the at the 50 delta, and that's what we report as the volatility. Um, that's the way I, I I think it should be done. And so I, I you know I've always had some issues with with the VIX, and you know now that that you know people are very smart out there. It's amazing. I have these clients that figure out things. You know, looking at the like Chris said the the white papers, and they figure out. They figure out ways to game a, a lot of these uh, products uh, that, that that have maybe not been thought through uh, all the way, and so I'm I, I'm leery of of the VIX um, as a you know protection. I, I I could you know some people use it well, but um, you know I I just like the the old fashioned having a put uh, way out of the money put and, ha and having some um, maybe some income timing on, on selling puts in order to pay for them. That's, that's, that's what I think is the, uh, safest way to protect a portfolio. But, you know, I mean, I, I just think that there's, um, you know, not only the, the, the February occurrence, the volopolis or whatever you called it, you know, but I think it's also people's trepidation of, of what's going on in, in learning about how the VIX might be manipulated. So, I mean, I think the SIBOs, is is good to come out with this. I think it's late. I mean, I think they should have done something a lot earlier to allay these fears and be more transparent. You know, I think you know it's it's difficult. I I, I empathize with them. It's difficult to manage. Uh, you know, their their goose with a golden egg or their vix over there. But you know, they they have they have to do something. I wish they would have done more. And but you know, it's a step in the right direction, Mark. You're right. The hour is late. But is indeed better, better than never. You're right in this case. Wish their hand hadn't didn't have to be forced by lawsuits, but conversation probably for another day. We have a lot of listener questions to get to. I just want to hit some numbers really quick. We touched on the OCC numbers. We do that. We do that every episode to kind of show you what's going on in the space. But OCC isn't the only game in town. In fact, that's very limited to just the U.S. Let's take a quick, broad, global view of the uh, derivatives market, courtesy of our friends over there at FIA, the Futures Industry Association. They monitor pretty much all the exchanges around the globe from a derivatives uh, perspective. And they have their numbers out for the first half of 2018. They said the total number of futures and options traded worldwide in the first half of the year, just a little bit shy of 15 billion contracts. That's up nearly 20% from the first half of 2017, a year ago. Uh, open interest uh, was 850.7 million contracts. That's roughly, that's interesting. That's unched from about a year ago. So that's interesting. So volume up, uh, but uh, OI pretty much unched <laughs> from a year ago, which is maybe a little bit surprising out there. Other some highlights they noted, uh, Asia Pacific and North America are still the hotbeds for growth when it comes to option. North America, of course, is the kind of the home base of all things options and derivatives. Uh, we saw an increase here of nearly 20% in line with the global trend. Asia Pacific had the greatest growth in absolute terms, 5.12 billion contracts traded in that area, up 1 billion or about 25% from the year before. Again, they're growing a smaller number, so percentage-wise it's larger, but still interesting to see uh, the growth rates there. A little bit more broad trends, equity index and futures options trading overall up 30% worldwide. So a lot of the focus still is. Uh, on equities out there, uh, commodity trading kind of lagging a bit. Ag's up 9%, energy only up 3%. Uh, where a lot of the interest was actually, pun intended, was in interest rates, volume, volume and open interest, both uh, very strong uh, futures and options on rates up 16%, 2.4 billion contracts. Uh, that's continuing the growth that's really started in 2017. Uh, Euro dollars and 10 years leading the way, 20.6% and 21.3%. Uh, respectively, uh, OI also increasing strong, up nearly 14%. Uh, 
Uh, we have some soybean stuff related to uh, the, uh, the, of course, the trade wars going on. So interesting stuff there. Just want to give a little bit of a uh, global perspective here on all things options. I know we want to get your perspectives as well. You guys always deluge us with great questions. So let's get to some of those. It's time to open up our office hours. It's time to answer your pressing questions about options. It's time to start our office hours. You can become a part of this segment by leaving a question on theoptionsinsider.com, emailing us at questions at theoptionsinsider.com, or via social media at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash theoptionsinsider, or stocktwits.com slash options insider. All right, everybody. Welcome to the office hours. This is the part where we hang on our shingle and you guys come come in with all sorts of fun questions. We also ask you guys once uh, really quickly as our, our question for the week this time is a fun one, kind of uh, germane to this audience. A lot of people like to look at analysts for what they think about their outlooks and things. We here on the old network prefer to look at what people are actually trading, particularly in the options world. So we look at options positions, what's open right now. We're playing a game out there asking you guys to join and say, what do you guys think is the largest options position that's open right now in a name a lot of you like to trade, which is SPY? Uh, So again, this is kind of a, of course, a broad index purview here. More of you trading a SPY probably than SPX, even though you can probably do a similar analysis for SPX out there as well. Uh, So we'll let you guys play along as well as as my cohorts here. Uh, Let's start with Chris, because Chris, I know you're seeing a lot of SPX. So I don't know how much spy you do. So but if the analysis is similar here, uh, I'm kind of curious if you had to guess one of these four positions, March 255 put, October 272 put, D's 31st, so end of year, 320 call, or the spy SEP 300 call. Uh, which would you say it is, sir? So we do trade a lot of spy options, uh, a lot of our SMAs and smaller accounts in the spy. So I'm going to go with the uh, SEP 300 call here. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, I know you sling a lot of spy, sir. Uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your votes here? And what do you think our audience is voting for? I'm going to go with the 320 call for end of year. So I think it's going to be those two. And, um, you know, it, as an overwriter, I could see the 300 call. But uh, I, think, I think I'm just going to take a... A flyer here and guess that there's some speculators out there and that the 320 call is going to be the pick to click. Interesting. Mr. Matt, you're the man with the data. We say no cheating on this one. You got to use your gut. Uh, so no crunch in the numbers, sir. Uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is the number one position, sir? Um, I'm not going to cheat. Uh, I was thinking the one that Mark picked, but I'm, but I'm going to go off and, and pick the October 272 put just hoping that there are people out there protecting their positions. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm torn whether I should reveal the answer now or I should wait because there are people listening live. But uh, uh, this podcast will probably go out after the poll is done. So would you guys like to hear the answer or should I save it and type it in the chat for you? What do you think? Oh, I want to hear it. You want to hear it? All right. I'll whisper it to you and hopefully no one's listening. <laughs> no, it's, uh, you, you were right, Mike. It is the D31, so end of year 320 call. That kind of surprised me a little bit. I was not Damn. expecting that uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty sizable number one too nearly i think nearly four hundred thousand contracts as if i recall so a pretty distant gal- gulf between one and the rest uh so yeah end of year 320s uh, upside maybe some overriding going on there either way uh interesting stuff perhaps not what you expected uh let's go around the horn here um let's see uh so many good questions here um let's go start with this one first actually because it's kind of very germane to what we do here on the show um this comes from La Rocha. He's asking, or she, uh, my client funds are primarily in SMAs in the 20000 to 50000 range. Uh, what is the best option strategy for these types of accounts? Uh, the time horizon for most of these accounts is at least 20 years. That's a good time horizon. Uh, with a long equity bias and fairly high risk tolerance. Thanks again. Just discovered the show, and I'm learning a lot. Well, first off, welcome. La Rocha, glad you can discover it. Hopefully you're, you're sinking your teeth into that back catalog of episodes. There's a lot of good ones there uh, for you to really check out when you're in your office or commuting or doing anything else. Uh, we got you covered with a lot of great advisors, options episode, covering the whole range, the whole gamut 
of strategies out here. But he brings up a good one. Maybe, Chris, we'll start with you because you were just talking about uh, your SMAs and how much you guys do in this. But I'm sure this is a question we get a lot. I'm sure you guys in all your different capacities get similar questions as well. Hey, I don't have $8 million in a client account to put towards this. I have some smaller amount, maybe in this range a lot. Uh, what is a good strategy? So, Chris, you, you must tackle this all the time. Uh, what are your thoughts here for LaRocha? He's got a long time horizon, wants to be long equities, and he's got in, in between 20 and 50K. Yeah, I think for you know, accounts of this size, you got to keep it simple. And uh, I think the right one of the answers definitely is the the wheel trade that we discussed earlier today. I mean, if they have a fairly high risk tolerance, then you know shorting puts. We all know that shorting premium over the long run is is a winning strategy. It is you know trading as Mike mentioned earlier. You know harnessing that volatility premium and trading it as an asset class. So if you have a long horizon and you can handle drawdowns and you want to be aggressive, then, you know, I think shorting puts or some type of put right type of index, something that's simple and, and easy to understand is, is what you need to do for these types of accounts. I was going to say the wheel, I, I didn't want to put words in your guys. mouth. I want to let you guys go first, but you're right. The wheel is a, uh, is an, it's, it's very timely. That's why I picked this question. <laughs> it is one you could certainly entertain. Mike, you're doing this day in, day out. In fact, as soon as we hang up this show, you're going to go out and manage some accounts probably in this range. So what do you have to say here for La Rocha? Uh, well, I just jokingly said that you should sell naked calls and lever them as much as you can, but maybe that was just uh, as big that that wasn't heard, but the wheel's the way to go in a lot of ways uh, as, as a good starting point for it. Uh, and Mr. Matt, the keeper of the data, the keys to the kingdom, if you will, uh, you, you're ma- you're starting to manage some some accounts over there as well. So this is one that's probably near and dear to your heart. I'm sure you get questions along these lines as well. What would you say to someone who's got this long time horizon, this kind of risk tolerance, wants wants to be long equities, and it's got accounts in this kind of ballpark range, sir? Yeah, I would keep it very simple, uh, long uh, ETF like Spy maybe sell some t- uh, 10 delta calls against it um if you're gonna if if the volatility gets high um you know maybe sell a put spread uh but have some long term puts just in case um that you know that's what I like to do for my own account uh you know collect a little bit uh, on the way out of the money uh, calls to to finance some of your out of the money puts you'll sleep easy and that's the way to go in my opinion all right, I've got so many great questions. We've got time for like one more. Maybe we'll do another. Maybe coming up, we'll do another big Q and A palooza because you guys have great questions all across the board. This one came in earlier the network, and it was a good one. And I, I it, it's a great thought question. So I thought I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on this uh, as well. This comes from Liz Lizender, <laughs> interesting handle, and they ask a good thought question. They say, if you had to start over with learning about and trading options, what would you do? differently and you know we touched about touched about this a little earlier in the week and I, I i don't like to do this but i kind of i kind of prevaricated a little i kind of hemmed and hawed because i really don't have an answer i mentioned kind of the way i came up which is the way chris and and matt and a lot of us kind of came up in the business through that market making kind of trajectory which was i think still is one of the best ways to really learn options because you're you're immersed in it you're in it and you're you're learning risk management because you're dealing with positions that you didn't want to begin with. <laughs> the customers are giving them to you. They're selling them to you or buying them from you. And so you have to deal with that. And if you can deal with positions you don't want and somehow make money off of that, uh, that's a great way to learn how to do this business. So I, I don't have a lot of regrets or things I would change about that, uh, which is a long way around to me kind of doing the same thing. I'm still kind of hemming and hawing on this one, which I'm, I apologize, Lizender. I haven't yet to give you a good answer, but I'm still mulling it over. So maybe you guys have one for me that I could go. Let's go back around the horn the other direction. Let's start with Matt this time. I'm going to put you in the hot seat, sir. Uh, you kind of came up in a similar way to me. Do you have any thoughts about maybe uh, what, what, would, what would you learn? What would you, st- what would you start over with learning about and trading options? What would you do differently? Uh, well, I've taught uh, many people. I, I back traders on the floor. Um, so one of the things that I would have changed about uh, backing traders was only get people that I could teach everything to. Because <laughs> uh, I think what happens is people get a false sense of security in the market. And especially a lot of these academics that you know think there's an efficient market, you know, you have to be very worried about, about what's going on out there. So I... I, I I wish I had just trained and, and backed people that that I trained solely. Uh, as far as um, as far as what I would do to learn it differently, you know, there weren't very many books back then. You know, I wish I had this type of a, of a back test. Like I'm constantly on our back tester, just looking at strategies and looking how they perform at, at different 
different times. So I think that's a good way to, to uh, help your your intuition. I think looking at the data, looking at um, the way implied volatility moves, and you know, I, I think I think what's so interesting is the way that options information is related to stock movement. Um, and you know, I think there's a lot to be learned in there. So I wish I would have focused a little bit more on the. Uh, summary data, which I'm doing now. That's what that, you know. When I'm when I'm not doing the the, the day to day, uh, I'm doing uh, I'm I'm researching. I'm looking for for indicators. You know, I think there's a lot in in volatility indicators and helping you trade better and uh, discovering you know what environment a particular ETF is in, or an index is in, or the market is in, and and how you should change your trading strategies based on that environment. So that's. That's where I wish I had focused a little bit more. And I think that's the future, a lot of of, of trading. You know, it's it's back testing. It's it's how to tra change your your strategies based on environments. Mark, that's a good point about think about the availability of data and you know just how much more of it there is than I think when most of us started in the space. And also the the counterpoint of that is the ability to to paper trade and kind of learn by practice before you do it. With the real thing, I mean, we all kind of ha did it with real positions, and so that was kind of a great way to learn or, or fail miserably. Uh, now the availability of data, so you can really do a lot of number crunching before you get into this. The free education that's available. I mean, you're right, Matt. Back when we started, it was here's your copy of Natenberg, and that was kind of it. Uh, now there's a lot more stuff, but not just our site or our network, but everywhere. You can go to OI Friends at OIC, have great stuff, optionseducation.org. Uh, you know, a lot of great places you can go for free, and then indeed some more and more advanced pay education if you want to go that route. And then, of course, uh, looking at the numbers and data. So all those things you could do if you really don't arm yourself with those basic steps before you start trading. Uh, that's, that's probably one of the closest things retail can do now to trying to replicate that track that we all took, which is to kind of immerse yourself in the data and the numbers and do a lot of paper trading to get a feel. For me, that's not exactly the same thing because it's not real money, but it'll give you a sense for how these things perform in the marketplace. And it's a good way to kind of do your own, maybe your own flavor, your own version of the uh, immersion training that a lot of us uh, got. Uh, Chris, same question for you. I'm curious, what are your thoughts here for Lizander? I've given you a lot of time to think about it now. What, what do you have to say here for Lizander? Um, it's a great question. I'm not the type of guy to, you know, hoped you know things would have been different in the past um i kind of got into this business i was very fortunate to be an intern at the uh, international trading institute and then you know kind of worked my way up the ranks became a market maker then became a, an instructor for the institute and all that stuff so I've, I've i've had a great opportunity to work with a lot of different people in this industry a lot of great people and i continue to have that opportunity so um i think the only thing i would say is you know i've looked at thousands and thousands of risk runs over the years and what i noticed is it doesn't matter how esoteric a strategy can be how many lines you're trading, how many you know quantities here and there. Basically, you know, a, a portfolio looks like a basic shape almost. It's going to look like a call or a put or a strangle or a straddle or a fly or something basic like that. So, I think if anything, I would have kept it a little simpler, a little more straightforward. Because at the end of the day, you can trade a one lot or a ten thousand lot. The risk reward profile is going to it's simpler than what you think. And I think people may, they complicate option trading a little bit more than it should be, especially on the risk management side. That's a great point. I like that. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can boil down a lot of positions into uh, their basic tenets, basic concepts. And it does right. It does often break down into a long call or a long put or a vertical or something else, an overwrite that you could usually wrap your, wrap your head around pretty easily. Unfortunately, that music means listeners... We've come to the end of another epic journey. I do love your questions. We had fun when we did that question, Palooza. Maybe we'll do another one of those again coming up soon. we got some new friends joining us on the next episode. They liked the big, uh, big Q&A Palooza we did last time, so I think maybe we'll, we'll kick things off doing those again. You guys certainly like sending your questions in, and I hate to make you wait a whole month, so maybe we'll, do, we'll bang out a whole bunch of them. Uh, next time but we'll, let's go back around the horn Mike you and I already kind of discussed that that question if you have any additional thoughts on it feel free and also if our listeners are intrigued uh, they hey, here's an advisor actually managing money with options and they want to learn more where should they go what should they do oh by all means check out my website at mtosa I'm sorry check out my website at www.stcharleswealth.com uh, learn a little bit more about what I do and uh be happy to work with anybody in any way. There you go. Check it out. Great website. Got a cool fox. Go on there. Click on it. You too can learn about what you can be doing with these SMAs and these account ranges. Maybe you got a little more and maybe a little, 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 little bit less. Uncle Mike, happy 
to walk you through basics like hedging, protecting income, all that fun stuff we talk about here on this show, and a lot more over there these days. Check them out, stcharleswealth.com. All right, and our friends at OIC couldn't join us today due to the holiday, uh, but you want to check out the course the question we just had, uh, optionseducation.org is the place to go to learn all about that. And, of course, if you want to dive into all their great advisor-oriented studies and research and data that they have, which is great when you're sitting down with clients, uh, click on the Advisor tab on the top right over there, and you log in, set up an account there, and it's free. And you can get all that great data we're talking about here. They're, they're the ones who keep a lot of the great studies, and they put them out there for free for you guys to use when you're talking with your clients. So take advantage of that. Uh, next time you're sitting down with the clients to explain why they should buy a put or sell a call or do both, uh, you have some data arming your conversation. That's always a great way to go. Speaking of data, the keeper of the options data, Mr. Matt Amberson and his team over there at Options Research and Technology Services. You like what we're talking about here? Guess what? We talk about a lot of data on the show this time and how, how, how the back tests inform your trading. It's a great thing you should be doing if you're not doing that already. Mr. Matt, if they want to learn more about uh, the great back testing functionality you guys have and all the other cool stuff you guys do, uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, come on over to orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com, and uh, there's a free trial of Backtester that you can get there. Uh, we also have a, a really neat uh, data API where you could get that, uh, some of that uh, serial form data, and you can look at um, what type of environment we might be in, is it a contango, is it all that. So there's a, there's a ton of data there as well. Uh, if you're a programmer. So uh, come on over to orats.com, Mark. Thanks. There you go, orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com. Check it out, whatever side you're on, whether you're on the advisor side, your asset manager side, you want to learn more about that kind of stuff, backtest some strategies. Maybe you're a super active retail guy, you want to learn what your advisor should know and you want to do some testing on your own, that's a place to go as well. Or even you want to, you're on the tech side. They got it, you're covered, orats. Dot com. Give them a follow over there on Twitter as well. Option Rats, R-A-T-S. You can learn more when we're in between when we're doing shows here about what they have going on over there and some great data and back tests they have over there as well. And last but certainly not least, Mr. Chris, sir, I know you guys are doing a lot of great uh, educational events, have a lot of great offerings. You, of course, have the website as well, swanglobalinvestments.com, the great blog there, Mark Odo, the rest of the research team cranking out a lot of great research on things like the 60-40 portfolio and what it can do for your portfolio, maybe what you should be doing in lieu of doing that. All sorts of interesting stuff. Check that out. But if, Chris, if they want to learn more, maybe they want to check out some of your educational events, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, well, we continue to do our 10th box seminars. That's a series of regional due diligence meetings. Uh, we, you know, we put those up for advisors and investors, and it's a great opportunity to sit with the portfolio managers and kind of discuss, you know, what are the challenges in today's market and how the defined risk strategy can be part of their investment solution. Great. And where do they find those, sir? That will be at 10thbox.com. That's 10thbox.com. Yep. 10th, the number 10, thbox. Dot com. Check it out. Probably one coming to an area near you quite soon. And on behalf of Chris and our guest Mike and Eric couldn't join us today from OIC and, of course, Matt and the team over there at Orats and, indeed, myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, joining us live, and for sending in so many great questions. I promise we'll get to more of them next time. Don't worry. And we'll see you next time for more of the Advisor's Option. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.